Almost about nine. Weeks. It's about ninety minutes. We had That's Klaus Kinski last week, so we went on and on and on. Klaus Kinski. Klaus Kinski. Yeah, he was he was here, and uh, he covered his films last week. He's dead. I know, but we just covered. No, his we films. but not me. I probably bought him at an auction, and he's here next to me. <laughs> we showed he's a bunch so... of his trailers and posters, and you know. He was an interesting guy. Hola, amigos, and welcome to the Spaghetti Western Podcast. Jay's on assignment this week in Almeria trying to get his microphone fixed. So, in his behalf, he says hello, and he'll be joining us next week. Um, I've invited a special guest this week, Bill Connolly. Bill and I go back some 40 years when uh, we started Westerns All Italiana, and Bill started Spaghetti Cinema. So... I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Bill to you. Anybody who knows anything about Spaghetti Westerns, have read anything about Spaghetti Westerns or martial arts, should know the name Bill Connolly or William Connolly. Excuse me, Bill. <laughs> That's okay. I go by Bill. So, Bill, let's start with a little bit of bio on you, and we'll build it up until you got involved with uh, Spaghetti Cinema. So. Okay. Uh, well, I was born in the Letterman Army Hospital on the Presidio of San Francisco back when it was a U.S. Army base. Uh, when I was a year and a half old, uh, our family moved to Okinawa. And one of the nice things about living on Okinawa is that you get the uh, the theater, the theaters on base uh, were playing the films intended for the U.S. military to view. And then off base, you'd get the films that were playing on the Japanese movie circuit. So uh, uh, my earliest recollection of an Italian Western was my sister saw Minnesota Clay back when it was first released. Now, were these um, in English? Oh, yes. Well, this is on the military base. Gotcha. Okay. At, the time, at the time, we weren't, uh, I didn't go off base to those theaters until uh, this theater across the street uh, played Son of Spartacus with Steve Reeves, gotcha. which wasn't playing at the military theater. So we went over there and that started me going to the Japanese uh, theaters. Um, but, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't notice that the Winnetou films weren't uh, were any different from the usual Westerns, aside mm -hmm. from Apache Gold being a little more violent than I was used to. But, you know, after Major Dundee, everything, you know, Right. Kind of changed. Um, but then um, uh, we knew about Fistful of Dollars before it, it played the theaters. And it was playing at the U.S. military theaters. And, um, you know, we had heard that it was uh, uh, from uh, an Italian director and that it was uh, more violent than many people wanted it to be. So uh, we went to see it. And uh, with my mother and, you know, pretty much the whole family. And my mother convinced me that it, even though I seem to remember enjoying it, my mother convinced me that it was a bad movie because it was too violent. Mm, now, uh, now, let me ask you this. Um, what year did you see it since it wasn't released in the States until 66? Yeah. Well, I saw it at the military theater, so it would have been part of the American release. So I'm thinking 66. Okay. I thought maybe you what, saw an earlier release. Right. No, what, it, what ended up happening for me is that, uh, so I kind of accepted my mother's prejudice against Italian Westerns. Then I happened to uh, uh, go off base to see a movie and I saw the trailer for Django. Mm. And uh, that became uh, something I would uh, regale people about because it just seemed so silly. Here was this Western where a guy suddenly pulls a machine gun out of a coffin and starts mm -hmm. mowing down a whole bunch of people. And so I, I'd laugh about that and say, this is a ridiculous movie. Mm -hmm. um, but then in, uh, I'm guessing it was the summer of 67 that uh, I spent most of my, you know, five days a week, my dad would drive to work and drop me off at this bowling alley and on the bowling alley jukebox was the uh, Seven Seas 45 for Django. Mm. And so I would play that over and over again and remember in my head uh, the trailer I'd seen for the movie with everybody getting machine gunned. Um, 
But the real change for me came when, because I was a big spy movie fan. Mm -hmm. I, uh, the Off Base Theater was playing Modesty Blaze on a double bill with The Return of Ringo. Uh, I got to the theater a little ahead of Modesty Blaze. And so I caught the last half of Return to Ringo mm -hmm. and I really liked it. Mm -hmm. So suddenly I was thinking that my prejudice was all wrong, that I should start investigating uh, Italian Westerns. And then a theater in Naha City uh, played Perché uh, Ukidi Ankara or Why Go on Killing. So I went to see that. And that was the first time I can remember a Western where I wasn't sure that the hero was going to survive. Wow. Um, then after that, I got a chance to see uh, Duejo with mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dan Vadis. And that was once again, uh, a Western, I wasn't sure that the hero was going to survive, particularly mm -hmm. after he got his hands mangled by the rope burns. Right. So, you know, I was all gung ho. And at this point, uh, my prejudice flipped and uh, all American Westerns were bad. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was what, 11, 12? Mm -hmm. uh, then um, a marvelous thing happened. Uh, as you know, um, as part of the, uh, the uh, settlement for the uh, plagiarism of Yojimbo, uh, right. Akurosawa Productions got the rights in Asia for a fistful of dollars. Correct. Yep. So uh, one of the interesting things I realized later was that when Django was released in Japan, it was given the Japanese title as like Zoku or again, whatever the title was for fistful of dollars. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was a double bill that was wow. playing at the off base theater, a uh, fistful of dollars in Django. And um, I found that I enjoyed fistful of dollars uh, more in Italian with Japanese subtitles. And then of course, that's also how Django played on that double bill. And I absolutely gotcha. adored Django. Mm -hmm. uh, just knocked me for a loop. Uh, I like to, you know, I apologize for my pronunciations of, uh, of certain Italian names. For years, I told everybody about this great movie by Sergio Corbucci. Mm -hmm. I say, do you mean Kabuki? I said, no, Corbucci. And then, of course, mm -hmm. later on, I found out that was wrong. Right. Uh, that was one of the things when I started meeting some of the actors who worked in Italy. Uh, I spent half the time correcting my pronunciations. Exactly, yeah. Um, like, you Same know, I here, went, yep. for 10 years, Giuliano Gemma, and then somebody said, no, Gemma. Said, oh. mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we never heard it pronounced any other way. We had to pronounce it ourselves reading right. video covers and stuff, you know. Right. So uh, let anyway, me ask you, let me ask you this. When did you start, uh, collecting the clippings and, the uh, um, ad mats and stuff like that? Well, Same time? Know, I had this, uh, my sister had a great movie scrapbook thing. And so I was trying to copy her for a while and I'd get these Japanese movie magazines, which would have these layouts on uh, these Italian Westerns. And I ended up, you know, ripping them out of the magazine and cutting them mm -hmm. up and pasting them on, in, uh, in scrapbooks. And of course, over the years, those all fell apart, which was kind of irritating. Right. I really, really wished I hadn't torn them out of the magazines. Uh, but yeah, I was, I was doing that, uh, one of my favorite remembrances of, of, of clippings was at the bowling alley I mentioned to you, they mm -hmm. used to get the Tokyo Times. And I remember opening it one time and there was a, you know, there was a, those were big pages in the newspapers right. back then. And I opened it up and they had a two page spread on Say Sai Vivo Spada, or If You Live, Shoot, or Django right. Kill. And like, you know, with the Mondo films, with the Mondo films are advertised, they would do like a banner of, of film frames showing all the atrocities of the movie. Oh, gotcha. As a border. And, so, and like the main image on the on this double page spread was the scalping scene. <laughs> and then like all around it were all these like step by step for the whole scalping <laughs> scene. And then at one one at one bit there was the uh, a dead hand on a horse's gut, oh, the explosion scene. 
So wow. I was, you know, wow, yeah. I can't wait for this to show up. And it, it showed up and I saw it and it became one of my favorite movies. It was mm -hmm. also in Italian with Japanese subtitles. And that's one of the things that bothered me when I finally heard the English language version of that is that the English language dub of Django Kill uh, screws up a lot of the bits in the movie. Oh, Same yeah. thing happened when I saw the English language version of Django, because mm. Django's got this great ending where he's, you know, going in the name of the father and of the son. Yep. And I have no idea why they decided to lose that for the English version. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess maybe they felt it was too Catholic or something. Yeah, um, but in any case, because I guess the Anglicans use the sign of the cross too. Yeah, sure. Uh, but anyway, um, so yeah, I was collecting this stuff and then uh, I really regret having, because I used to get the 7Cs 45s Mm -hmm. For like Return of well, it was, RCA was was the ones with Return of Ringo and Pistol for Ringo and stuff like that, and I would cut up the uh, picture sleeve and stick it in my scrapbook. Mm -hmm. boy, boy, I really regret having done that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, so you know, I and it was one of those things like I was the only person I knew who was interested in these movies, mm -hmm. uh, and then of course I found out that. Uh, you know, many of the people that I was enjoying in these movies had previously done the sword and sandal films. Right, like right. Sergio Corbucci, who did Django, had done Duel of the Titans and Son of Spartacus. And uh, it's kind of like when um, uh, I decided that uh, I was going to forgive uh, Clint Eastwood for leaving Italy and making movies in America. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I really didn't like his first number of movies that he made in America. Then he did Two Mules for Sister Sarah with music right. by Morricone. And right. I was going, okay, I, li I, I like that. And then I realized that it was the same guy who had directed a number of movies I loved as a kid, like The Killers and Hell oh, is yeah. for Heroes. So, you know, my expansion of, of taste occurred. Um, then, you know, like I said, for the longest time, I didn't know anybody who also had an interest in these movies uh, pretty much until I moved to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And um, then one day, uh, a fellow I knew who was running a movie memorabilia store named Jerry Neely. Jerry, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. he, uh, he saw an ad in the big reel for a Italian Western fanzine by this fellow named Tim Ferrante. Right. So uh, we ordered this, copies this, of that. This is the Connolly Mafia. This is the <laughs> <laughs> this this group of friends preceded the Leone Mafia because we'd go over to Bill's house, and he would rent a uh, a movie, and show it on a projector on his wall, and there'd be a dozen of us or so over there eating popcorn or whatever and watching movies that. And again, I was tickled pink because he didn't rent Fistful of Dollars. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. He showed that uh, my name is Pecos and stuff that we would never see anyplace else. And that and I was tickled pink because I hadn't seen any of those, just read about them. So his mafia actually precedes the Leone mafia. Well, what <laughs> happened was... Go ahead, Bill. Uh, well, I contacted Tim Ferrante after I got that first issue. And I told him, well, I oh, wait, had wait, seen... Wait, wait, wait. Where did you get the first issue? Uh, there was an At ad Neely's? in the Big Reel. I, so I, we, okay. ordered the, we ordered it through the mail. And then after I saw the issue, uh, I contacted Tim Ferrante and mentioned to him that I had seen uh, two movies that he seen. Mm -hmm. I think he mentioned not having seen, meaning Django and right. uh, Great Silence, but, you know, J Django Kill. Yeah. Uh, and um, so I, I wrote uh, reviews of those two movies and sent it to him. And then one of the things that happened is that after he got my review, he got a copy of Django and he said, mm. well, you better watch it again and make some corrections in your review, in your synopsis. And because um, what happened to me was that uh, there was a movie called $10,000 for a Massacre. Right. With Gianni Garco and playing Django. Right. And since it had Laura Dananusiak as the right. female lead, right. I was thinking it was a sequel to Django. Gotcha. So I made the mistake of thinking that the character she played in Django was named Mijanu, 
as she is in $10,000 for a massacre. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, so uh, Tim sent me a copy that he had film changed because I guess he was working at ABC at the time. Yeah, it was ABC. Yep. And he got a copy, a 16 millimeter print and he film changed it and he sent me a copy. And I went, oops, I didn't remember this exactly right. Mm -hmm. So I made changes. Uh, but uh, it took uh, him so long because like I had gotten the issue we got was, was two. Right. And it took him so long to put out what became the double issue of three, four. Right. That uh, I, Jerry Neely and John Sullivan decided, well, why don't we do our own? Mm. And of course, being interested in like the Hercules movies and even the horror movies, I was thinking, well, we wouldn't just cover Westerns. Right. So uh, then Jerry Neely suggested the name Spaghetti Cinema. So we went with that. And originally, the three of us were supposed to contribute. Mm -hmm. But it ended up happening that I was the only one who was getting stuff done. So it became sort of a solo project. Uh, though for a while there, John Sullivan was doing my covers. Right, Because I right. wrote it like a, a fanzine kind of uh, jokey, hum amusing cover. Uh, that's yeah, the first issue right that's there. That's the first issue, right. The interesting bit about that is that John Sullivan did the logo. Oh, okay. Spaghetti yeah. Cinema logo? Right. was John Sullivan, whereas the images of Eastwood and Reeves were done by... Uh, another fellow who only worked for that one time on that one cover, and I'm blanking out on his name. Mm. Um, but he noticed that uh, he had to hand draw the cigarello out of Eastwood's oh, yeah. mouth. Yes. Um, so anyway, um, we you know we were doing that for a while, and then um, at a certain point. Uh, uh, Fred Olin Ray mm -hmm. used to be a uh, customer of Jerry at his store. And Fred Olin Ray came in one day and bought the copies of Spaghetti Cinema that were there at the store. And he said that, because uh, Fred Olin Ray at the time was working with TWE. Okay. TWE, uh, Trans World Entertainment. Right. Uh, which was run by the Saruli family, who are longtime uh providers of film equipment in Italy. Okay. So when Richard Harrison uh, came back to the, to the United States, he uh, contacted the Silurulis asking basically he was looking for work because mm -hmm. he wanted to restart his American career. So the Silurulis contacted Fred and said, well, you want to work with, with Richard Harrison? And Fred called me up and said, do you want to meet Richard Harrison? <laughs> and uh, I said, yes. And so he, they, that was the first of the, uh, the people who had worked in these movies that I got a chance to meet. Um, and uh, so, you know, I've known Richard for a number of years. I haven't seen him in a number of years now. Uh, the last few times I saw him was at the Italia Film Festival. Right, right. They have every year. And I guess his wife is part of the board uh, that puts the whole thing together. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last time, the last one I was able to attend before uh, COVID was um, uh, they had finally found this good print of Jesse and Lester. Oh, wow. Uh, from a German Blu-ray mm -hmm. uh, in English. And so they were projecting that on this big screen there at the... Uh, uh, Chinese Norman. theaters six. Yep. yep. And um, so, you know, he was there and he was, uh, it's, it's interesting for me because most people don't seem to like that movie very much, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, he says it's his favorite film and said it's probably the closest character to himself. And of course, if you've met Richard and you're not surprised that he identifies with a guy who wants to find this fortune so he can start a brothel. <laughs> but anyway, um, so anyway, um, we started Spaghetti Cinema, and then around that time, I, Tim Ferrante turned Westerns Italiano over to you. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one of the first times I met you, we went over to the uh, Motion Picture Academy to look at right. their uh, their archives right. and stuff. Right. Oh my God, that we used to go over there and park on the street because there's no lot. 
and it right. was uh, parking meters. I'd have to run down every hour or so <laughs> and put a quarter in there, whatever. And Bill and I yeah. were like uh, woodpeckers saving acorns for the winter. I mean, we were all over that place trying to get find material, get copies of it made, all within the three or four hours that we were there, you know. But it, it was an amazing know, collection. As much as uh, we could get away with getting them to photocopy for us. Yes, yes. And that, was, that was back when the Academy Library was on Wilshire. Right. And then it moved to this new facility. Uh, I can't remember what street it was on, um, which, which was closer to South Central. And then now, I guess it's all moved to a place on Vine. Mm -hmm. But, uh, oh no, I guess I take that back. Now it's on this, with the old Macy's building on Wilshire. Oh, okay. Uh, which I haven't been to. Of course, now I'm living in Upland. It's a little hard yeah. getting. Yeah, me you know. too. I haven't been to the to there since we, you and I went years ago, you know, uh, when right. it was on Wilshire. Yeah. But it, was sure, it sure had uh, material that we couldn't have found anyplace else. And, uh, you know, it was nice that uh, Richard Harrison, entered, you know, put me in contact with Robert Woods. Mm -hmm. The first time I, I talked with Robert Woods was via telephone because he was living in Colorado at the time. Right. Uh, and then eventually he moved to Los Angeles. Uh, well, actually, uh, uh, I guess you would say North Hollywood. North Hollywood, right. And then um, uh, Richard also put me in contact with John Delaney. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then I think it was Gene Quintano contacted you. Right. For our Tony Anthony um, interview. Right. Well, the, the, the good thing about Bill and I collab collaborating was that he was, he knew much more than I did about Italian films, French films, German films, whatever I was concentrated on the Westerns. Bill didn't drive. So I would pick him up and we would go interview somebody or whatever. And between the two of us, uh, we could fill a couple of hours. I think when we interviewed Walter Barnes, we were there like the whole day until yeah. he finally booted us out. I think we were there like six hours. But it was, yeah, it was interesting because everything that we talked about, I mean, he knew and he knew we knew our stuff. So it wasn't like, oh, crap, we can't get rid of these guys. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. And the other thing I remember, Bill, was most of these guys kept nothing. I mean, we yep. would bring over posters and press books and stuff like that that they hadn't seen in 30 years, but they had nothing on them of their own that they brought out. Robert Woods did because he'd sent it back to his mother, and Walter Barnes had a whole box of stuff that they both allowed us to take and make copies of for the fanzines, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, as soon as we told them that we knew about this film or that film, they were in seventh heaven. So, yeah, the, well, the Gene Quintano thing was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. The, the Gene Quintano contact, you know, got us in, you know, with uh, with Tony Anthony. Well, and let's, then let's stop there because Gene Quintano, be, the contact that helped there was Steve James. Right. Steve Steve because, knew G, uh, Quintano, and Quintano he gave him my phone number, and Quintano called me, and then we set up the appointment to talk to the uh, the blind man crew. Yep. Yeah, and Steve James had done um, Delta Force. Right. With a guy who was a writing partner for Gene Quintano. Right. So consequently, that was how that contact got made. One leads to another. Yep. Uh, I just remember, you know, the first time I met Steve James in person, uh, he came by the apartment and I was in my room in the back of the apartment. Mm -hmm. And Rosalyn came, you know, came out to say that there's somebody at the door. And then all of a sudden, this really large black fellow came <laughs> into, my, into my bedroom. Yep. And the first thing he did is he looked off to the side and said, oh, Aldo. Uh, it was a I, I, remember that, I remember we were both shocked. We, well, he must know his stuff. He recognizes Aldo Sambrell. Yep. Right. Yeah, and, uh, he was a great guy. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, so we, we uh, you know, we, then there was a one time where uh, Gene and Tony invited us over to his brother's lawyer. His, bro his brother was a lawyer. And we and were having a get together in his office. In Beverly Hills, yes. Uh -huh. Right. And uh, Lloyd Batista was there, uh, yep. and that was that was a great day. And we were there for like three hours, yeah. Because they again, one one thing led to another there, and they hadn't been together for a couple of years, right? And so uh, we had posters and everything, and they wanted to, they wanted to take them from us. 
Well, the fun part about that also is that uh, Tony was very interested in talking about uh, the production side of those movies, yes. about how they, uh, uh, when they were doing, particularly when they were doing Coming At You, they mm -hmm. kept running out of production funds and somebody would have to sneak currency into Spain. <laughs> yes, remember that? Yeah, right. I remember yeah, that. How yes. that uh, they were they were they were getting a little nervous because the gypsies who were there, uh, the horsemen were uh, uh, not happy about not being paid on time. Right. And remember, he told us one of the problems that they had was in the beginning when they made the films, they'd hire a, one of the gypsies as a stuntman. He'd do anything that we'd want to do. And then as they became more sophisticated, they say, oh, you want me to throw a knife? Oh, that's an additional amount of. Posadas <laughs> or whatever. Oh, you want me to fall off a, off the balcony? Well, that's got, will cost you such and such, and their prices kept going up and up and up and up. Yeah. Well, that was the thing. Uh, uh, Steven Spielberg, who had shot uh, Raiders of the Lost Dark in Spain, um, at a certain point uh, after Franco died, because I understand Franco kept the cost of making movies in Spain uh, yeah. ridiculously low. Because mm -hmm. that was one, the, one ways that he was getting uh, the outside countries to deal with, you know, his fascist government. Gotcha. Uh, and then once he died, everything, uh, all of those restrictions went away, and mm -hmm. it suddenly became expensive to shoot in Spain. Right. Uh, I guess is why Cold Mountain got made in what Bulgaria. Yeah, or, or Romania, whatever. Yeah, right. Something like that. Yeah, but um, yeah, it was. Uh, and then, of course, uh, trying to think of other people we met, uh, the people we met through Tony, uh, the people we met through, uh, well, Richard Harrison introduced us to Robert Woods and John Delaney. Uh, well, I remember the, the funny thing I met with, with Richard Harrison was you told me he was coming over to your apartment such and such an afternoon. Would, would, you, would you like to come over? I said, sure. So he came over and he came. And we're talking about different people, and we're talking about Nello Fini, Pazafini, Nello Pazafini, right. and I forgot Giovanni Pazafini. Right. And he didn't know who the heck we were talking about. Finally, he said, "Oh, Nello," because that's right. what he knew right. him by as the as the nickname. Yeah. Yeah, you know his uh, his uh, his daughter is on Facebook, mm. and has posted a number of pictures of her with her with her father mm -hmm. uh, at a very young age and that kind of stuff. And, yeah, it, uh, uh, of course, the guy that Richard Harrison kept talking about with a great deal of affection was Livio Lorenzo. Right. And uh, how, you know, he would, of course, it, it was when I first met Richard and we were going through my pile of, of, of pictures and stuff, he would stop and go, okay, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead. <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, kind of bittersweet. Yeah. Uh, but you know, Richard was really hoping to get uh, work going in uh, in America, you mm -hmm. know, back in Hollywood, and uh, you know, various things didn't quite come through. Um, but he felt that uh, all of a sudden, all of these uh, ninja movies that showed up at video stores really hurt his chances. Yeah, yeah, it just, uh, didn't show him in a very good light. Well, uh, the, the other thing I remember too is you and I used to go over to. Um, used bookstores, Hollywood collectors, the one out in um, Glendale. And uh -huh. we pull these boxes of ad mats and stuff and just go through them. And like you said, a lot of them were like what you collected. They had already been cut up. But if we could find anything salvageable, we would just use them as, you know, cut them up ourselves and put them in the fanzine because where else yeah. were you going to find that stuff? But, yeah, we would spend hours in bookstores looking at books and posters and anything else that they had crazy well it was it was when i uh there used to be a store on um oh i'm blanking out on the name of the street uh it's one of the main drags in hollywood there was a place called bond street books okay. right across from the hollywood post office and one of the first times i went in there they just had like a, a six foot pile of lobby cards mm -hmm. and uh he was selling them for 50 cents each Mm -hmm. And I got an almost complete set of seven guns for the McGregor's lobby cards. Mm -hmm. And then I noticed I also got a number of up the McGregor's lobby cards. And I thought it was very odd how many times they would use the same image from seven guns on the lobby card for up the McGregor's. Oh, yeah. Right, right. And just put the different um, title on there. Yep. Right. So, uh, 
Yeah, and then they moved that to Burbank, and suddenly what had been a rather smallish store in Hollywood became this huge place mm -hmm. in in Burbank. And then at some point they they kind of divided it up between a paperback exchange store and then Movie World, and of course yeah, Movie, Movie World, World yep. has has now gone away. Yep. But, uh, they used to have this great thing at Movie World in in Burbank where they had all these uh, assorted stills just in boxes outside the front door. And oh yeah, I remember dollar, that on tables. Yeah. A dollar a still, right? Yeah. And you just go through that and you get your hands all grimy and grimy. <laughs> You'd yeah. I would find all kinds of stills for uh, not only Italian movies, but also for Hammer films because I was a big Hammer film fan. Right. And, um, you know, now I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to do with all this stuff? I know, me too. Yep. Because uh, I've collect, uh, I've kept all that stuff in in uh, boxes and file cabinets and stuff. But it was amazing because we would start, and they did, a lot of these times these people didn't, even though they were in the movie business, they had no idea what these films were. Right. And you could make them a deal. You know, I'll, I'll take ten of these for two, two bucks instead of fifty cents a piece. Oh yeah. And then they after after a while they would get to know what they were, and then, and then they wouldn't make deals with you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's kind of like uh, uh, no one in my family is all that interested in this stuff. So I'd be thinking if I was to suddenly just drop dead, uh, I've left a lot of stuff for them to try to figure out how to get rid of. Mm -hmm. um, one of the nice things about this new house where we moved into here in Upland is that I've got a lot of wall space. So gotcha. I've, able, I've been able to put up about oh, 15 posters. Oh, that's cool. So, you know, it's, uh, now I'm thinking, well, and it turns out I went th through a box that I just marked posters and it turns out that I have posters I didn't know I had. Because mm -hmm. uh, I, I went through a period, of, I went through a time of trying to put all the one sheets in plastic uh, bags. Uh, protectors, yes. Back. Yeah. Yep. And uh, then it turns out I've got a whole pile of ones that I, I, I didn't get uh, that, you know, mm -hmm plastic sheeting for so right oh well you know i guess these are, yeah, these are not, not one thing leads to another i mean you could you know put them in glass it just yes. goes on and on and on about yeah, I, I, posted, stuff. I posted a picture of uh some of my hammer film posters and a guy said well you know you better get that framed mm -hmm. or else it's, i'm thinking i i've got I can't afford to frame all yeah. my posters. Right, exactly. I'm not running. A, I'm not running a museum here, with uh, donations coming in left and right to frame all this stuff. Right. Just a ba basically, we're collectors. Yep. Yeah, and then um, I was just thinking of. Uh, uh, I remember uh, when um, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. Sink, the fellow from Turkey. Oh yeah, C E N K. Right. Corral, Chink Corral. Yes. Right, he uh, he was the Mickey Knox guy. Right, he had he had talked to Mickey Knox. Have you mm -hmm. read Mickey Knox's book? Yes, loved it. Well, my problem with it was he seemed to be more interested in telling us about Ernest Hemingway. Oh, I know, <laughs> I, and about Sergio Leone. Yeah, but um, um, so you know, uh, then of course I you know was. Uh, one of the nice things about where I used to work is that they had a good photocopier mm -hmm. and uh, and a good printer. Mm -hmm. So uh, I uh, was finding it very easy to uh, to put out copies of the fanzine. Uh, I know that at one point you went ahead and bought your own printer and you right. bought a color printer. And, uh, you know, it starts, ink gets so expensive. Oh, I know. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Beginning, we just did black and white. Yeah. And like you, I would use the company the company I worked for, their photo machine. And, of course, they got better machines as time went along, so the quality improved. But, you know, I don't think we had more than 300 max uh, subscribers. But right. to do that over a week's period of time and then assemble it, put it in envelopes, address them, take them to the post office, you know, send – these overseas and these to the United States, it was really a hassle. Well, that was, the nice thing about that was like, I'm complaining about how many posters I have. 
a lot of them was I was dealing with a fellow named Werner who uh, had a, a poster business mm. and he was willing to trade. Werner Lehman? Yeah. Yeah. And so I got a lot of good stuff from him. Yes. And uh, so, you know, and I used to, it was always fun going to the post office because you never knew what fanzine from somebody you don't, you've right. never heard of before, right. uh, sends you a copy in, in, uh, in trade. So that was fun. Mm -hmm. uh, or going to Larry and, Edmonds and look on the rack and see something that you'd never seen before. Yeah. But also the, uh, uh, right now on Facebook, I'm uh, uh, scanning a number of these uh, French uh, photo novels. Mm. And a lot of those I got from this fellow in France who would send them to me in trade. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the and, ones where they would use the color covers. And sometimes yeah, had, Gordon Mitchell would pop on there or yeah. whatever. And then the story would be each frame of the movie translated into French. Sometimes they've got the characters wrong or the oh, actors yeah. wrong, but they were, they were good. Yeah. And of course it always bugged me the fact that the covers had nothing to do with the actual movie. Right. They were right. Uh, and then they have a, they have a, they'd have a girl in a bikini on the back cover. Oh yeah. Often. <laughs> Yeah, a number of those I, I was looking, uh, like one or two I had to look up on the internet to try to find out who the heck they were. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so, you know, I, I'm learning stuff I didn't know. I, oh. I didn't know who Gloria Paul was until uh, I came across that photograph of her on the back cover wow. of Sparsini of Barura. And then I uh, looked her up and found out that she had quite a television career. Well, she also worked, started as a dancer at the Follies Brigere. Right. And, and she, she, uh, but, what, she was married to, or was she married or just a companion? Uh, was it Piccioni? I think so, Piero Piccioni. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, I've never, I mean, typical. You read in one book, they'll say his wife. Another right. one, they don't mention wife. They just say, you know, uh, mention her name. So I've never determine whether she was actually married to him or not. But but yeah. I guess uh, she's, she's on Facebook. Robert she? Monell, Robert Monell mentioned to me yep. that uh, she's a Facebook friend of his. Bill, Bill after Spaghetti, Spaghetti Cinema, Cinema was going for a while, you started a martial arts fanzine also abbreviated to Mama. Do you want to talk right. a little bit about that, how it got started? Well, what happened was... Um, I did. We did the first issue of Spaghetti Cinema, and then uh, KTTV was playing Black Belt Theater, and okay. suddenly there were two movies made in Hong Kong with Richard Harrison. Mm. Uh, one was Marco Polo, and the other one was The Boxer Rebellion, which of course got different titles for the United States. And so I figured, well, for issue number two, I'm going to do an article about Richard Harrison. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, uh, I saw Gladiator 7 when I was very young, and then I saw El Rojo when I was a little older, and then I saw Masterstroke on her Britannic Majesty's Secret Service, and uh, now I've seen him in, you know, these two uh, Shaw Brothers films. So I felt that this was a way that I could deal with uh, all of my interests, the mm -hmm. Sword and Sandal films, the spy films, the Westerns, and Hong Kong films. Gotcha. And uh, about that time, uh, a book was published called uh, Martial Arts Movies from Bruce Lee to the Ninjas by a fellow named Rick Myers. Oh, yeah. And uh, at the end of Rick Myers' book, he said, well, if you're a big fan and you want to talk about these things, you know, write me a letter. So I wrote him a letter. And uh, basically I was saying, uh, you know, I'm interested in this kind of stuff. And it turned out that he happened to be in Los Angeles when he got the letter. Gotcha. So he contacted me and he asked me to show him around to uh, places where you could get these kind of movies in Los mm -hmm. Angeles, Chinatown, Little Tokyo, that kind of thing. And so I was thinking, uh, he was talking about the fact that he wished he had a vehicle to talk about all the movie, the new movies that came out after the book was published. Gotcha. And so I said, well, you know, you can do a column for Spaghetti Cinema. And he said, well, no, 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 let's go ahead and do our own thing separately. But rather than the 50 pages that you put into Spaghetti Cinema, we'll keep it down to like 14 pages. Gotcha. 
And so that's how Mama came about. Um, and the idea was that since his book was martial arts movies, he would make this martial arts movies associates. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we did that for a number of years. Uh, then at a certain point, uh, he got a column uh, in Inside Kung Fu where he could write about the more recent releases. And so, you know, they paid. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. So he, he wasn't that interested in, in collaborating on Mama anymore. Sure. Um, uh, and, you know, like, like Spaghetti Cinema, I haven't actually given up on doing another issue. It just, it's been years. And like I said, I don't have access to the, uh, uh, the photocopiers and things like that that I used right. to have at work. Right. So it makes all this much more difficult. Plus, the thing that really became apparent to me, especially with mailing stuff overseas, mm -hmm. is that the postage costs have gotten. Uh, oh, yeah, they triple. They really went away from what I felt was comfortable. Exactly. Uh, I mean, You're more I, I more postage than you are the fanzine. Right. You know, I, I used to have no problem putting together a package of three VHS tapes and mailing it to Canada or uh, Great Britain. The, the postage didn't seem outlandish. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, uh, I got an order for some issues to send to uh, to Europe. And we're talking 20 to 40 bucks. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of going, I... at that point, when you started your, uh, your blog, you know, taking it online right. and, and doing it that way uh, was much more economically feasible. Um, but you know, uh, I, uh, I now have, uh, well, I've, I've had a blog for a number of years now, uh, spaghetti cinema. Correct. Usually if you, if you Google spaghetti cinema, uh, you'll find a link to my blog. Uh, you'll also find a link to a festival they had in Scotland a number of years ago who actually wrote me and asked me permission to use the spaghetti cinema name. Oh, cool. Um, so, and then of course, sometimes you get restaurants. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, actually at one point, I don't know if you remember, but at one point Robert Woods was talking about, thinking about starting uh, a restaurant called Spaghetti Westerns, mm -hmm. where all the decor would be posters from the movies. And of course there would be Italian food. Right. Um, but, uh, uh, I, did I? Did we, we, we? We mentioned, I think, that uh, through Richard Harrison, I met Gordon Mitchell. Oh yeah, yeah. You we also talk about you, got Gordon. Chance, you got a chance to spend time with Gordon and Mickey. Yep. Mickey Hargitay. Mickey Hargitay. Uh, yeah. Um, and then we got to spend time when Gordon passed away. All all of them were at the memorial service. Right. Along with Arnold, he had just yes. been elected governor. So, yeah, well, yeah. he was, he had also, because uh, when I met Gordon, he was, uh, he was helping out behind the counter at the World Gym in Venice. Right. And uh, during the time that I knew him, Arnold purchased, you know, World Gym. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, but like, uh, after, I, I guess when Gordon came back to the States, uh, he was not very strong financially. Mm. So... Uh, he had helped start Gold's Gyms with Joe Gold. Joe Gold, uh -huh. and then also uh, was a, I guess, a partner in World Gym. So uh, Joe Gold was was uh, was helping him out when he came mm -hmm. back, and um, uh, giving him a place to stay and that sort of thing. And then we were at the the funeral uh, at uh, World Gym in Venice. Right. Uh, uh, Ed Fury was there. Brad Harris was there. Right. Mickey Hargitay was there. Um, I don't think uh, Rock Stevens was there. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember him being there, no. No. But uh, that was the thing about uh, uh, I almost got a chance to uh, meet Rock Stevens. Um, but that's a whole other story. Um, but I saw him when about a year or so before that, they were honoring all the Hercules actors at the mm -hmm. uh, the annual Muscle Beach uh, okay. tournament contest uh, in Venice. 
uh, the, I think uh, Labor Day. Mm -hmm. It was a thing they do there every year at Labor Day. And they had uh, all the people there. Um, of course, Mark Forrest did not show up. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess he's now living in Arizona. But in any case, a um, lot of uh, interesting people. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you look, was, you look back on it when, when we started, if, if you'd have told us you'd meet so-and-so or so-and-so along the way, but you're crazy. Oh yeah, no, we had no idea we'd meet these people. No, and no, no. Uh, um, then of course there was the uh, the uh, the Spaghetti Western Film Festival in North Hollywood, mm -hmm. which unfortunately we've not been able to do a second time. But uh, uh, you know, Brett Halsey was there. Uh, it's funny, I, I didn't realize that Michael Forrest had made Italian films. Mm -hmm. uh, and then all of a sudden, um, they, I started finding them, you know, mm -hmm. he had popped up in a number of things, not just 100 rifles. Right. Um, uh, of course, Ed Burns didn't stick around very long. Uh, <laughs> Ed Burns was a last minute addition. Right. Thanks to Ollie Lamage. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that, um, uh, uh, yeah, it's it's one of the one of the things that came to mind, um, like the first time I interviewed um, Robert Woods. Um, there were a number of people he had worked with that he did not have fond memories of, mm. but I noticed that as he's uh, as more and more people have interviewed him, uh, he doesn't have the the uh, the animosity that he had when I first. Oh, really? Talked. Yeah, I was going to say I've never heard him. Don talk to somebody. If he does, right. he just he'll just uh, make a grunt or something and not say anything. So, right. Wow. But like I guess uh, like when uh, when Eric Mache interviewed Thomas Million, mm -hmm. uh, Thomas Million uh, wanted to be able to edit the transcript of the interview. Right. Right. And then uh, Eric was complaining that he took out everything bad he said about anybody. <laughs> yeah. Eric, Eric Eric sent me both both copies. The one the original. And then the yeah. one that Tom Wass sent him with all the notations and corrections and cross outs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I, you, I have, you, uh, you, you know, you take what you can get, you know, I mean, we were sure, choosing. Sure. Well, when we, uh, when we interviewed Aldo Sembrell at Don Bruce's house. Oh yes. Yes. Um, you know, it was a great chat and we both had our tape recorders going and I found that because of all the background noise and how quietly Aldo oh. spoke, I couldn't transcribe much of it. Yeah, yeah. Plus, it would have been a you know six issue interview by the time you got done with all of that. But yeah, I agree. A lot of times you record something either live or on the phone. And I'll admit to you, when we talked to Tony Anthony, they were talking about Guadix and stuff like that. I had no idea what they were talking about. Right. I had never heard of the, the you know, the towns uh, because they weren't movie town town names. They were actual cities. So right. I had to go back and find out what the hell is Guadix and how do you spell it and what, you know, whatever. It's interesting to me also that um, um, the first time I heard about somebody going to uh, Almeria or Spain to find, you know, the movie locations was an article in Cine Zine Zone. Hmm. And uh, a fellow I know in France sent it to me. Excuse me. He had translated it into English so that mm -hmm. I could run it in Spaghetti Cinema. And then, um, then Mike Eustace uh, started uh, writing about his memories of right. going look, looking for the locations uh, back in 1974. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he was even on the set of Stranger and the Gunfighter. Right, right. I remember and that. took some pictures. And then, um, then you know, of course, Don Bruce, you know, got the idea of uh, going to every location that wow. Sergio Leone ever All used. All the Leone locations, yes. Uh, well, he even we even went to the pub that they used in Duck You Sucker. Well, they went, yeah, they went, they went, he went to, uh, to Italy to uh, film the caves that they used in Duck right. You Sucker. He went to uh, Ireland. To right. do the the pub, that's right. And plus the um, the tree and yeah. the road they drove the car. Oh my God! Yeah, I know. And then uh, you know, and of course he was he was talking about uh, putting it together in a book, but 
you know, right. unfortunately, he uh, he died. Yeah. Uh, well, that brings us full circle, Bill. That brings us to the Connolly Mafia, the <laughs> Yoni Mafia. Uh, anything else you're working on today? I've collected uh, thousands of movies that I've not watched yet. So I'm yeah. uh, slowly working through that, except, you know, uh, they keep making new ones. Well, of course you can't, so, you, you so can't I, I uh, can't catch, catch up. up. They're still making more. Um, right. So you're on Facebook as William Connolly. Yes. And you have a blog blog address. Oh yes. Uh, uh, spaghetti cinema. Um, I don't know the address off the top of my head, but as I said, if you Google Spaghetti, spaghetti cinema, cinema, you usually find me right near the top okay. of the list. Very good. Well, appreciate you uh, giving us your time today, and uh, great to see you again. Uh, like you said, it's been a long trail, and uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll end it there. And uh, for the audience, adios, amigos, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>